بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة وقال تعالى وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين وقال تعالى وما أرسلنا من رسول إلا ليطاع بإذن الله وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين صدق الله العظيم وصدق الرسول النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين Respected brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah we're pleased to inshallah announce that we are starting a new series on the blessed seerah and the biography of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And why this is important is because the seerah and the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for a believer is the understanding of the entire deen. Every aspect of our religion, every aspect of Islam is directly connected to the life of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And why it is important for us to know the biography and to know the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is because he was a role model for us. Every single human being in this world, they need a model. They need a guide. They need an example. But what example is the best example? Is it the example that we choose? Who are the models that are worthy to be followed? Now if we leave it to human beings themselves, the role models that people follow, they're either a sports player, or a football player, or a basketball player, or an actor, or an actress. If you leave it to human beings, they're going to pick somebody as their role model who is not worthy to be a role model. They're going to choose somebody to be a guide who is not worthy to be a guide. Now I want to ask everybody a very simple question. A person who takes a ball and he kicks it inside of a net, or a person who throws a basketball inside of a hoop, is this person worthy to lead me in every aspect of my life? Why would I follow him in every aspect of my life? Just because he can throw a ball inside of a hoop? Just because he can kick a ball inside of a net? Just because a person can do acting on the television, that person is my role model? Of course not. This is foolishness. This is unwise that we should take a person as our role model who has nothing to do with life. How is that actor going to show me how should I be a father? How is that football player going to teach me how should I be a mother? How is the football player going to tell me how must I conduct myself with my children? That's not his job. And I always mention this, some of the youth that are here, there was a rapper, an artist, what they call themselves an artist, a singer. He said, don't you, don't, aren't you worried that youngsters, they're going to be looking up to you, that you're smoking weed, you're smoking marijuana, and many of the youth, they look up to you. Doesn't that bother you? You're their role model. And you're doing this, you're smoking marijuana. Doesn't that bother you? That they're looking up to you as a role model? Do you know what he said? It's very important. Listen to what he says. Listen very closely to what this rapper, this, this entertainer, he said when it was asked of him, are you not concerned that people are taking you as a role model? He said, I don't care. Take your father as your role model. I want you to buy my music. I want you to buy my records. I don't care about you following me as a role model. I'm not a role model. Let your father be your role model. I'm a singer. I'm an entertainer. Give me your money. Buy my records. 
Subhanallah. This is a slap in the face for those people who take them as role models. Now we come to the real role model. Who is the one who is worthy to be an example? Who is the one who is worthy to be a role model? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Surah Al-Ahzab, ayat number 21. Surah Al-Ahzab, ayat number 21. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Subhanallah. Verily, indeed, in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have the most beautiful example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this. Allah has selected Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam as the most beautiful example. Uswatun hasana. What is the meaning of uswatun hasana? The most beautiful example. Allah is saying hasana. Hasan comes from husn. Husn means beauty. In every aspect of his life, it was beautiful. If you want to look at him in any aspect, I was mentioning in my Friday khutbah, in my Friday Juma talk, Ram Krishna Rao. Look him up. He is a philosopher and he was a professor of philosophy. Non-Muslim. Ram Krishna Rao, he was saying, I am most amazed by this man, Muhammad. I am most amazed by him. Why? Because if you look at any aspect of his life, he was amazing. If you want to see him as a politician, he was a politician. If you want to see him as a father, he was the greatest father. If you want to see him as a philosopher, he was the best philosopher. If you want to see him as a warrior, he was the best warrior. If you want to see him as a saint, he was a saint. If you want to see him as a wise man, he was the most wisest of men. If you want to see him as the governor, he was the governor. If you want to see him as a ruler, he was a ruler. If you want to see him as a prophet, he was a prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, you will not find any human being in the history of humanity and civilization like him. Allah Abu Sayyidi rahmatullah alayhi in the Qasida, Bush, uh, Qasida Burda, he says, Bushra lana ma'ashar al-Islam inna lana min al-inayati ruktan ghayru munhadimi. Bushra lana ma'ashar al-Islam inna lana. Glad tidings to us, the people of Islam. We have such a pillar that can never be demolished. We have Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Surah An-Nisa, ayat number 64. And we did not send any messenger except that he should be followed, except that he should be obeyed, so we understand that we need role models. Humanity needs role models. One of the most beautiful uh, sections that I've read about the Prophet ﷺ's life is by uh, Thomas Carlyle. You can look it up, in 1860s. Thomas Carlyle, who's a British philosopher, he wrote Heroes and Hero Worship. And he has one section on prophet, hero as a prophet. The hero as a prophet, and he has Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu He was one of the greatest heroes of humanity, was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Right? In that he mentions, is that human beings need heroes. Human beings need somebody to follow. If they don't, they're going to follow something. They will follow something bad. They will make up their own heroes. They will make up comic books. They will make Superman. They will make Spider-Man. They will make Batman, right? They will make Ant-Man, whatever man. They'll make all these men. Why, why are they making this? Do you know why they're making this? Because we need heroes. We like the stories. But all of these heroes and all of these stories, they are not true. They are false. They are fake. They are fairy tales. But whose story is true, right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Right? نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ The best of stories, the best of heroes, is the, is the stories of the Prophets السلام, And the best of the Prophets was Sayyidina Muhammad wasallam. So why it's necessary for us to know about his life? Because he was a true superhero. He was the real deal. He was the real thing. He was not a fable. He was not a story. He was not fantasy. 
He's not a comic book character. He's a real human being who walked this earth, who lived and breathed, and everything about his life is real. That is narrated by the authentic Sahih narrations. Conveyed to us through authentic narrations. Conveyed to us through Kitabullah wa Sunnatu Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is the objective, the purpose, the fundamental purpose of why we need to know the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Is because we have to have a role model. We have to have an example. And the greatest role model and the greatest example is the one who he is real. He is not a fairy tale. And the one is not that he is selected by anyone. He is sele selected by Allah Himself. And not only was he selected by Allah Himself, Allah said, I have selected him for this. Right? And Allah Ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا In another ayah, Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ He is a rahmah. He is a mercy for all of the worlds. So from this we understand that the purpose of studying the seerah is so that we can come to know what is the best way of life and the correct conduct in everything. And it is through the life of the Prophet ﷺ that we can determine that. Also, recognition and knowledge of the life and the conduct of the Prophet ﷺ is the most important necessity of humanity. The most important necessity for humanity after knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowing the messenger. But even before knowing Allah, how do we know Allah? How is it possible to know Allah? The only way that we can know Allah is through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's no way that we know about Allah. How do we know about Allah? How do we know who is Allah? How do we know to worship Allah? How do we know to pray to Allah? How do we know to devote ourselves to Allah? It is only through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is why Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, I wanted to read this very beautiful quote. Zadul ma'ad fi hadi khayr al-ibad. So this, these, this seerah dars is going to be inshallah conducted from very authentic books. Books of the seerah by, written by very great scholars. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he writes in a very, very famous book, Zadul Ma'ad fi Hadi Khayr al Ibad. He says, وَمِنْ هَا هُنَا تَعْلَمْ إِذْتِرَارُ الْعِبَادِ فَوْقَ كُلِّ ضَرُورَةٍ إِلَى مَعْرِفَةِ الرَّسُولِ He says, from this you understand that the human beings, they need more than any other necessity in life, the necessity to know the messengers is greater than any other necessity in life. To know about the Prophets and to know about the lives of the Prophets, this is the more necessary than any other necessity in life. Why? It's because it is only through the messengers that you can come to know about Allah. Listen to what he says. فَإِنَّهُ لَا سَبِيلَ إِلَى السَّعَادَةِ وَالْفَلَاحِ لَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَلَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ Illa ala aidir rusul. There is no way to everlasting success. There is no way for a person to know what is happiness or success in this life nor in the hereafter, except through the means of the messengers. Do we know about Jannah? How do we know that there is a Jannah? How do we know that there's Jahannam? How do we know what is halal and haram? How do we know what is permissible and impermissible? How do we know Salat and Zakat and Hajj and Salm and fasting? How do we know? The only way we know is through the messengers, alayhim salatu wasalam. Imagine how important it is then. And even if Allah Ta'ala says, Aqimu Salata, you will not understand Aqimu Salata except through the Prophet. Establish the prayer. How do I establish the prayer? The Prophet will tell you how. Give the Zakat. Okay, how do I give the zakat? The Prophet will teach you how. Do the hajj. Do the umrah. Okay, how do I do hajj and umrah? The Prophet will tell you how. Do we understand? And why, my dear brothers and sisters, this is very important. Because nowadays, people want to take Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa out of the equation. They said, we don't need hadith. 
We don't need the sunnah. All we just, just read from the Quran. The Quran is enough for us. Subhanallah, if the Quran is enough for you, if the Quran is enough, then where in the Quran does it mention the method of prayer? Where in the Quran does it tell us how do we discharge the zakat? Where in the Quran does it mention how I must do hajj and how I must do umrah? Where in the Quran is these things mentioned? What should I recite in the first rakat? And what should I recite in the second rakat and the third rakat and the fourth rakat? What should I read when I sit in tashahud? What is tashahud? Where is the azan mentioned in the Quran? We give azan in every country, in every Muslim land, in every masjid, they give azan. Where is the azan in the entire Quran? Where is the words of the azan? Challenge these people. Say, I challenge you. Go to any masjid in the world, they give azan. Prove to me the azan from the Quran. You will not find it in there. Why? Is the Quran incomplete? No, the Quran is complete. The Quran told you, follow Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah wa ati'ur rasul. Obey Allah and obey the messenger of Allah. Man yuti'ir rasula faqad ata'a Allah. He who obeys the messenger, he has indeed obeyed Allah. So these people who say we've only followed the Quran, they are not following the Quran. Their iman is half. Their iman is not complete. So this is very important, brothers and sisters. What Imam Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he says, فَإِنَّهُ لَا سَبِيلَ إِلَى السَّعَادَةِ وَالْفَلَاحِ لَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَلَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَيْدِ الرُّسُلِ There is no way for success and prosperity in this life nor in the hereafter except through the messengers. وَلَا سَبِيلَ إِلَىٰ مَعْرِفَةِ الطَّيِّبِ وَالْخَبِيثِ عَلَىٰ التَّفْصِيلِ إِلَّا مِنْ جِهَتِهِمْ And a person will not know what is right or wrong, what is good and evil in detail except through the messengers. وَلَا يُنَالُ رِضَ اللَّهِ أَلْبَتَّ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَيْدِيهِمْ And a person will never attain the pleasure of Allah, absolutely will not attain the pleasure of Allah except through the messengers. فَالطَّيِّبِ مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ وَالْأَقْوَالِ وَالْأَخْلَاقِ لَيْسَ إِلَّا هَدْيُهُمْ وَمَا جَاءُوا بِهِ Therefore, the most acceptable in actions and in words and in deeds, the acceptable actions, the acceptable words, the acceptable deeds will only be recognized and understood through them. فَهُمُ الْمِيزَانُ الرَّاجِحِ الَّذِي عَلَىٰ أَقْوَالِهِمْ وَأَعْمَالِهِمْ وَأَخْلَاقِهِمْ تُوزَنُ الْأَقْوَالُ وَالْأَخْلَاقُ وَالْأَعْمَالِ It is, they are, the, they are the measure, they are the gauge, they are the thermometer, they are the scale by which we weigh the deeds and the words and the actions. They are the scale. Who are the scale? The prophets. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَبِمُتَابَعَتِهِمْ يَتَمَيَّزُ أَهْلِ الْهُدَىٰ مِنْ أَهْلِ الضَّلَالِ And by following of the prophets, we come to know the difference between the people who are guided and the people who are misguided. How do we know who is guided? And how do we know who is misguided? By seeing who follows them and who doesn't follow them. Those who follow them, they are the guided ones. وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا And if you follow them, and if you follow him, you will be guided. Allah said, this is all from the Qur'an. So those people who say we follow the Qur'an, but they don't follow the hadith, then they are not following the Qur'an. Actually. فَالضَّرُورَةُ إِلَيْهِمْ Subhanallah. Now, listen. Subhanallah, what Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah is saying. فَالضَّرُورَةُ إِلَيْهِمْ أَعْظَمُ مِنْ ضَرُورَةِ الْبَدَنِ إِلَىٰ رُوحِهِ وَالْعَيْنُ إِلَىٰ نُورِهَا والروح إلى حياتها فأي ضرورة وحاجة فردت فضرورة العبد وحاجته إلى الرسل فوقها بكثير عجيب سبحان الله look at what Ibn Qayyim is saying this is in the beginning of his book زاد المعاد في هدي خير العباد he says therefore ضرورة إليهم أعظم من ضرورة البدن إلى روحه the need that we have for the prophets and recognizing the life of the messenger, the need for that is more than the need of the body for its soul and the eye for its sight and the soul for its life. Because without knowing 
the life of the Prophet and without knowing the teachings of the Prophet, our Islam and our Iman has no life. And this is why a lot of the deviation that has come about in our day and age, a lot of the misguidance that has come about in our day and age is because of this. Is because they are separating the Prophet ﷺ from Islam. And they know that you will not reject the Quran. They know that Muslims, no matter what you do, they will not reject the Quran. So what do they do? They will put doubt in your heart about Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They will put doubt about his seerah. They will put doubt about his life. They will be put doubt about the various different situations that took place in his life. All of that, the, the objective of it is what? All of it is so that eventually they know when you start doubting Muhammad, nothing is left of your deen after that. What is left of Islam? What is Islam without Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because the life of a Muslim, the key to understanding every aspect of the religion for the life of a Muslim is Sayyidina Muhammad Wasallam. Every aspect of our life. And the Prophet Wasallam himself said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you see me praying. In another hadith he said, Khudu anni manasikakum. Take from me your manasik, yani the rights of hajj. Take from me, learn from me the hajj. I don't know if you know the Prophet ﷺ did only one hajj. He did only one hajj. And in that one hajj, he did the whole hajj on camel. Why did he do it on the camel? He did it on the camel so that everybody can see him on a stage. Take from me your manasik. He, Allah says, وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ Complete the hajj and umrah for the sake of Allah. Then Allah Ta'ala doesn't mention the details. And somebody asked me recently, he said, Shaykh, I'm starting to get doubts about this matter of the Qur'an. I said, what doubts? He said, maybe the Qur'an is not complete if it's not telling us the details. I said, no, the Qur'an is very complete. Because if the Qur'an was to explain every single detail, then the Qur'an Sharif would be how many? It would be 15 volumes. You've seen fatwa kitabs. Any of you seen the fatwa kitabs? One fatwa kitab is 10 volumes, 15 volumes. So if every single detail was actually mentioned word by word inside of the Qur'an, it would be a haraj. It would be a difficulty. It would be a burden. Nobody would be able to memorize it. Now you have the people, they have the Torah and they have the Talmud. Nobody memorized the Talmud. Ask one rabbi, have you memorized the book? Nobody has memorized the Talmud. Nobody has memorized the Bible. They have every single little, little, little detail that the, the priests, they put inside of it. They want to put everything in there. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Quran ijmal, general. And the life of the Prophet was the tafsil. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Quran like this. Allah Himself said, this Qur'an is going to be explained to you by your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَنَزَّلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we reveal the Qur'an to you so that you may elaborate to the people that which has been revealed to them. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala didn't say that everything is going to be here. He said, we revealed the Qur'an to the Prophet. And the Prophet through his life and the Prophet through his example and his teachings and his sunnah, he will then teach you the meanings of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, that he is the one who sent the messenger. What did the messenger do? He calls them to these ayat. وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ He purifies them. He purifies them. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ And he teaches them the kitab. The kitab is Qur'an. وَالْحِكْمَةَ And the hikmah. Now what is the hikmah? The kitab is Qur'an. What is the hikmah? Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah said, and the hikmah is the sunnah. It's the explanation of the kitab. It's the explanation of the Qur'an. It is the tafsir of the Qur'an. So the seerah of the Prophet is the tafsir of the Qur'an. 
The sunnah of the Prophet is the tafsir of the Quran. And the statements of the fuqaha, Abu Hanifa, and Shafi'i, and Malik, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, this is the explanation of the sunnah. So the Quran is explained by the sunnah. And the sunnah is explained by the fiqh. So we have the Quran, the sunnah, and the fiqh of the fuqaha. Subhanallah. It works hand in hand. You cannot separate it. If you take away the sunnah from the Quran, you're going to become confused. If you take away the fiqh from the sunnah, then the sunnah can also confuse you. So this is a beautiful way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved our deen. The Quran was preserved, which are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the sunnah was preserved, which is the tafsir of the Quran. And our fiqh was preserved in the Hanafi and Shafi'i and Maliki and Hanbali Madahib to preserve the sunnah. Subhanallah. All of this works together, hand in hand. All of it works hand in hand in an amazing way. This is how our deen was preserved. Another point of the importance of the seerah is, I read a very beautiful thing that said, even if you are atheist, even if you don't believe in God, you must know this man. I read an article and the title of the article was, you must know this man. Amazing. So I was reading why you must know this man. He said you must know this man, whether you are a believer or you are an unbeliever or you are a Christian or you are a Buddhist or you are a Hindu, you must know this man. Why? Because he was the most influential man in all of civilization. The Encyclopedia Britannica. You've all heard of the Encyclopedia Britannica? The Encyclopedia is a, like a dictionary of all concepts. 30, 40 volumes. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, he says, the most successful of all religious personalities of the world was Muhammad. Can you imagine? The Encyclopedia Britannica, when in the entry about the Prophet ﷺ, he said, the most successful of all religious personalities of all humankind was the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. If this man is so successful, we have to know, okay, what made him so successful? Subhanallah. Sir George Bernard Shaw, I mean, I could keep on going. In the Jummah prayer, I was explaining how all of these uh, Western scholars, professors, doctors, Western scholars, how they praised the Prophet ﷺ. Sir George Bernard Shaw, in the 1800s, he said, if Muhammad was alive today, this is amazing. Look at what he says. And he's speaking to a Christian audience. He's speaking to a British audience. He says, If Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was alive today, he would succeed in solving all the problems that threaten to destroy human civilization in our times. All of those problems that we see today that is plaguing humanity, all of the problems that we see today that has become so dangerous to humanity. If Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was alive today, he would have solved all of those problems. This is amazing. The interesting thing, there's a, a book written by, I've been reading this, Leslie Hazelton. She's a contemporary scholar. She says that this is one of the most significant figures in the history of human civilization. He said that time in the 7th century, he said pre-7th century, and then you have post-7th century. The time in which the Prophet ﷺ came in history was the center piece of all of humanity. It's amazing. He said it's as if he came right in the middle of human civilization at the time when the world was in complete darkness. At the time when people were confused, at the time when the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire and the African Empires, everybody was completely, they were falling apart. They were crumbling. They were close to collapsing because there was no other way that humanity knew they were in complete darkness. It was at that time in the 7th century, it is as if somebody knew that this is what humanity needed at this time. Subhanallah. The way that they're explaining it is mind-boggling. 
Amazing. It says as if someone knew that this is exactly what the humanity needed. Yes, somebody did know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew. That is why he says, Wa ana khatamun nabiyin, la nabiya ba'di. I am the last of the messengers. And I will come in the time when the humanity is in need the most. Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Right when humanity was about to crumble and collapse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his rahmah. His rahmah. For all of the worlds. It was at that point that the entire world changed. And the renaissance that took place in Europe was also to the barakah of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ and Islam. We know that a renaissance took place in Europe in almost the 11th or 12th centuries. The reason or the, you can say the underlying cause of the renaissance was actually when the western world became in contact with the Muslim world. And they started learning the culture of Islam and the scientific advances and all the other aspects of the Muslim civilization which then saved them also from destruction. Otherwise before Islam, what were they having in, the, in Europe? The bubonic plague. Tens of millions of people literally died because they don't even know how to wash their hands and they don't know how to wash their bodies. They would take one you know, shower a, a year. They would think that taking a shower is bad luck. This was, the, this was the society until they came and they saw, you know, in the Holy Lands, in Beit al-Maqdas, and they came to Jerusalem and they actually came into contact with Muslim civilization. Then they realized, actually it was the Muslim civilization that saved the West as well. Otherwise they were close to destruction. They were afflicted by the bub bubonic plague. I'm just giving one example. There's the hundreds of examples. Tens of millions of people literally died because these people don't know basic hygiene. They don't know that washing themselves, washing their hands. Muslims already, they're washing their hands before and after they eat. A sunnah. That you wash your hands before and after you eat. You make wudu maybe five times a day. You make ghusl once a week. At least, if you don't need a major ghusl, then at least the sunnah ghusl, which is once, once a week. If you don't need the other ghusl, which is necessary. And wudu, you have to make every day. And miswak, subhanallah, you have to do. And itr and perfume is a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine, these things were not even in their minds. It was not even in their concept. Ghusl, they didn't even know. Istinja, they didn't even know. And half of their population of Europe was wiped out because they don't know istinja and ghusl and washing their hands. Can you imagine? Like this, he was rahmatul lil alameen. When they came just in contact with the civilization of Islam, it saved them from destruction. Just the contact. They were just touched with the intention of war, with the intention of fighting. But even though it was for the sake of war and fighting, they still became exposed to the culture and the civilization, which saved them. Imagine if they would have accepted it. What would have happened to them? So this is, was part of what Leslie Hazelton, that he is one of the most significant figures in the history of human civilization, that what happened then, she says, is an integral part of what is still happening, a major factor in the arena of the world today. A very beautiful statement, I'm gonna explain. She's saying, what happened to the Prophet then, is an integral part of what is still happening in the world today. And she says that it is, it is not, it, it's, it's indispensable for a person to know about the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam because without knowing his life, you will be completely ignorant of what is still happening and continue will, that will continue to happen in history and in politics and in religion Without knowing him, you are completely in the dark of what, about what is going on in the world. So this is why, my dear brothers and sisters, it is necessary for us. This is one of the hukuk and the rights of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imam Qadi Iyad rahimahullah taala in Ashifa bi hukuk al Mustafa. He writes that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he has five 
haq upon us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has five haq, five rights upon us. What are those rights? We say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Allah has a right upon us that we believe in Him and that we follow His commandments. آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ كَمَا هُوَ بِأَسْمَائِهِ وَصِفَاتِهِ وَقَبِلْتُ جَمِيعَ أَحْكَامِهِ Allah has a haqq upon us that we believe in Him, we believe in His sifat, and we accept all of His commandments. What is the haqq that Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has upon? Number one, an ta'rifahu. The first right that he has, that we must know who he is. How can you say Muhammad Rasulullah and you don't know Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So that's number one. The first haqq, the first right that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has is ma'rifah. Ma'rifat rasul Recognizing the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَمْ لَمْ تَعْرِفُوا رَسُولَكُمْ فَهُمْ لَهُ مُنْكِرُونَ and do they not recognize their messenger? Hence, they are rejecting him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked this question to the mushrikeen. Do you not know this messenger? And now because you don't know him, you're rejecting him. So it is necessary for every Muslim to know him. How do we know him? Number one, through the quran e kareem وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ and we did not send you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except as a mercy. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Really, in Rasulullah sallallahu you have the most beautiful example. وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا And the fuzzle of Allah and the grace of Allah upon you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is immense. All of these verses talk about Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No place in the Qur'an did Allah Ta'ala say, Ya Muhammad. No place in the entire Qur'an does Allah Ta'ala say, Ya Muhammad. Look at the Qur'an. Allah Ta'ala says, Ya Zakariya. Ya Yahya, khudhi al-kitaba bi quwa. Ya Maryam. Ya Isa ibn Maryam. Ya Musa. Right? All of the Anbiya Ali Musalam. Ya Ibrahim. All of these verses. Ya Dawood. So many verses. Old Prophet. All this. Taking the name. But nowhere Allah Ta'ala says, Ya Muhammad. What does Allah Ta'ala say? Ya Ayyuhal Nabi. Ya Ayyuhal Rasul. Ya Ayyuhal Muzzammil. Ya Ayyuhal Muddathir. Subhanallah. Why? Because when somebody has such a maqam, such a manzila, such a status, then it is not appropriate to take the name of that person. So you mentioned the status of that person. You mentioned the position of that person. You mentioned the duty of that person. So Allah Ta'ala says, Oh my Prophet, Oh my Messenger, Oh the one who is covered in a mantle, Oh the one who is covered in a blanket, SubhanAllah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of this shows the Avama of the Prophet and the greatness of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we must come to know him. Because if we don't know him, then we will not be able to follow him and we will not be able to love him. And that's the second and the third one. Number two, after you know him, then you must believe in him. Because many of the Jews of Medina, the Yahud of Medina, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَإِنَّ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ Many of the Yahud in Medina, they knew the Prophet. They knew all the signs of the Prophet. But they did not believe in him. Subhanallah. They denied him. They didn't believe in him. Out of jealousy. Why is he not from Bani Israel? Why is he from Bani Ismail? He's not of us. We thought that he will be of us. He's not of us. So we will not follow him. They were jealous. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Jews, they believed in him. They, they recognized him, but they did not believe in him. That is why the second haqq that he has, alhamdulillah, all of us have this, 
that we, when we, after you know who, who he is and how great he is, to know that none but a messenger could have done that. Nobody but a prophet could have done that. Imam al-Bayhaqi in Kitab al-I'tiqad, he mentions the greatest miracle of the prophet is his life. أَعْظَمُ مُعْجِزَةِ النَّبِيِّ صلى الله عليه وسلم حَيَاتُهُ وَسِيرَتُهُ أَعْظَمُ مُعْجِزَتِهِ The greatest miracle of the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was his life. That literally in like one decade, he conquered and he turned upside down an entire society of Bedouins and feuding tribes. How do you do that? Even the non-Muslim scholars who study his life, they're saying this is mind-boggling. How can a human being do such a thing single-handedly? That is why Imam Bayhaqi said that if you only ponder, you will know that there must have been divine intervention and the power of God and the miracle in what manifested itself at, in, in his life. It wasn't something that just was done just accidentally, haphazardly. It just happened. No, it didn't just happen. But this was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we must also believe in him. Because when you study his life and you read about him, you will come to the same conclusion that it could not have been done by a normal man. Therefore, the second haq that he has, not to just recognize him and stop there, but now when you recognize him, recognize that this could have not been done by a normal person. And this is one of the greatest miracles of his life. If you really study his life, unbiased, without any Islamophobia or any other other propaganda that's urging and, and tainting your decision because that, that has a big effect on our thinking right the bad thoughts and the Islamophobic thoughts and the propaganda that is put in our mind then that affects our judgment don't unbiasedly anybody who studies his life unbiasedly will come to this conclusion that a normal man couldn't have done this so you must believe in him then and I challenge anybody, find any likeness of that in all of history. That is why Michael Hart, when he wrote the book, The 100 Most Influential Men in History, he studied all the history and all the personalities of civilization. And he said, nobody is as successful as Muhammad because he was successful in every aspect, not just one. So study unbiasedly, not from the perspective of all these other things that might be propaganda and Fox News and CNN and NBC. That's affecting our judgment and the church and all these other people who are slandering without listening to the slanders. Biographical accounts, not one-sided, holistic study of his life. So this is the second. And once you believe in him, not only to just believe in him, some Muslims think that the Prophet wasallam, he was a person, he just brought us the Quran and then Khudafiz, salamu alaikum, never to be seen again. He's not just somebody that he brought you the message. May Allah Ta'ala forgive us. Some Muslims think that the only duty that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi had was to convey the message and that's it. No. An-Nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum. Subhanallah. This ayah shows he's not just a postman. Na'udhu billah. Na'udhu billah. That oh, he, here's your... Here's your Quran. Okay, salamu alaykum khudafiz. That was my job. I have no other job. No. An-nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. Wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum. What does this ayah teach us? The Prophet is more important than our own selves to ourselves. An-nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet is more important to us than our own selves. And his wives are our mothers. Why was this ayah mentioned? This ayah was mentioned so that we have love for the Prophet. لا يؤمن أحدكم The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين None of you has true faith until you love me. Yani Muhammad sallallahu until you love me more than your parents, more than your children, and more than the whole world and everything it contains. He was not just somebody who delivered the message and he has no other right upon us. La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. Okay, I'm done. Subhanallah. No. An-nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. 
The Prophet is more beloved to us than our own selves. وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ And his wives are our mothers. Can you imagine? If his wives are our mothers, then what is he to us? He is more valuable than our father. He didn't say, أَنَّبِيُّ أَبُوكُمْ He said, أَوْلَى مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ because your father is your father, but he says, no, the Prophet is not just your father. The Prophet is more important to you than your own self. He didn't say the Prophet is your father. مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ He said, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is not the father of any of you people. He said that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi is more important to you than your own self. Can you imagine? How much then love are we supposed to have for him? How much then dedication are we supposed to have for him? It's not just a person, like when we think about, what is he to me? Is he my father? Is he my teacher? You need to think about, what is he to you? Is he my father? Is he my teacher? Is he my guide? Is he my murshid? What is he? He is above all of that. He is beyond all of that. He is awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. He is more important to you. He is more, takes more precedence to you than your own self. He is more precious to you than your own soul. Subhanallah. Yani this is an expression. An expression that he is above and beyond any of these worldly relationships that you can think about. You know when you think about father, and you think about teacher, and you think about ustad, and you think about muallim, and you think about murshid, he is beyond that. He is awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. He takes precedence over your own soul upon you. Subhanallah. This is beyond what we can imagine. So we have to love him. Because love of him is the sign of true iman. And then after loving him, if you just love him, then even loving him is not enough if you don't follow him. Somebody says, I love the Prophet, I love the Prophet, but he doesn't follow the Prophet. Abu Talib, who was the uncle of the Prophet wasallam, he loved him very much. He said, oh my nephew, till the last breath in my body, I will protect you. But in the last moments of his life, Abu Talib said, ala millati abai. Ala millati abai. On the way of my forefathers. He said, oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah, say it in my ear so I can make shafaat for you, so I can intercede for you on the day of judgment. Just say it in my ear that there's no one worthy of worship but Allah and I am the messenger of Allah. He said, no, on the way of my forefathers, I die. So he loved the messenger. But it wasn't enough just to love him. You have to follow him and you have to believe in him and you have to obey him. If you don't follow the Prophet, then you could de have defended him your entire life. Abu Talib, and he defended the Prophet his entire life and he loved the Prophet. He loved him like his own son, but it was not enough because he didn't follow him. He followed the way of his forefathers and this was not enough for his najat, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And then lastly, is what do we do? أَن تُصَلِّ عَلَيْهِ That you send salawat upon him. إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Verily Allah and his malaika they send salawat and rahamat and mercies and blessings upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah and his angels Allah and his, Allah is sending mercy upon him and the angels are making dua for him constantly daiman abadan daiman abadan constantly Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu O you who believe do you want to pay him back for all the good that he did for you? You will never be able to pay him back. So ask Allah Ta'ala to send salutations and blessings and mercy upon him. This is a haqq. The ulama mentioned that at least once in a lifetime you should say salawat. It is wajib. At least once in a lifetime to say salawat and durood sharif upon the Prophet Sallallahu because of this ayah. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Alhamdulillah, we read it in every prayer. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama salli ala Ibrahim. In every fard salat, in every namaz. Isn't it? Our namaz is not even complete without salah ala nabi. Our salat is not complete without durud sharif. Salat is incomplete 
Allahu Akbar. This reminds us of the haqq, the right that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has upon us. So these five huquq, number one, an ta'arifahu, that you should know him. An tu'mina bihi, that you should believe in him. An tuhibbahu, that you should love him. An tattabi'ahu, that you should follow him. Wa an tusalli alayhi, that you should send salutations upon him. Insha'Allah, this was just an introduction. The rest of these series, insha'Allah, will be focused upon very, very amazing topic, and that is the heart of Sayyidina Muhammad Allah Azza wa Jal said, Alam nashrah laka sadarak. Allahu Akbar. Did we not expand your heart? Did we not open up your heart, O Muhammad And Allah Ta'ala says, Nazala bihi ruhul amin ala qalbika litakuna min al mundirin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibreel Amin upon the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what actually inspired this series? I was reading the book of Imam al-Suyuti, Al-Khasa'is al-Nabawiyyah of Imam al-Suyuti. And I opened up and I was looking at all the chapters and it says, Babu Qalbihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The chapter on the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I was amazed. I said these people and these ulama also wrote about the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I was just amazed. He begins the chapter with, Alam nashrah laka sadarak. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nazala bihi ruhul amin ala qalbika. The heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the place where the Quran descended. The heart of Muhammad ﷺ was the markaz of all mercy. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ Allah Ta'ala says if you were hard-hearted and harsh, then the people would have run away from you. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ But because of the mercy that Allah put in your heart, you have become kind to them. Subhanallah. Allah Ta'ala is describing the heart of Muhammad Sallallahu in the Qur'an. That is the place of mercy. And it is the center of blessings. And it is the place where the revelation and where Jibreel Alayhi Salam is coming. So inshallah, this discussion is going to be an amazing discussion. The heart of Sayyidina Muhammad many times was opened and washed by Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salam with the water of Zamzam, and in one riwayah with the water of Jannah. Subhanallah. The first heart surgery, the first heart surgery in entire world was the heart of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're going to talk about that, inshallah. This is the physical heart, and also then the spiritual heart. The spiritual heart is, what were the characteristics and the sifat and the qualities that emanated from that heart? What were the beautiful attributes, the mercy, and the compassion, and the bravery, and the generosity, and the kindness, and the, all of the good that emanated from the Prophet, emanated from his heart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his blessings upon that heart. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik wa majjid wa karim ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun al-musarim wa alhamdulillah.